Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody over at the St. Chris. Hello. So, okay. Um, yesterday we finished uh, the two lecture set on intermediary metabolism. And now for the rest of the year until the new year, uh, we will be talking about uh, signaling mechanisms. And today is, in a way, the master signaling mechanism, the G protein. I'm sort of sorry that we're doing this one back to back. Um, I got to say that uh, in the last 24 hours, I've probably spent six or seven hours thinking about this lecture and revising it. And I think maybe for the first time that I've ever given it, is I might have a hope of understanding it. Um, I had not really realized the uh, overwhelming importance of the G proteins and the full signaling cascade. So here's our outline for today. Uh, there are two groups of G proteins, two large groups, um, the heterotrimeric G proteins and what we'll just call small G proteins. And the simplification of this that, again, I hadn't realized until, frankly, a few hours ago, was that the heterotrimeric G proteins are about extracellular signaling. This is going to be intercellular signaling from one cell to another. And the small G proteins are basically uh, going to be coupled to intracellular signals. And we'll look at uh, these G proteins as regulatory proteins and also how they are regulated. So there, when we talk about G proteins, aside from these two very large different groups, uh, we're talking about uh, really fairly large families of very diverse proteins. But all G proteins uh, share uh, this, uh, well, I would say two things. First of all, their role has to do with signaling. They all share that. And secondly, that they all are capable of uh, uh, binding both GTP and GDP, and they have intrinsic GTP hydrolysis activity. That is, without anybody else, any other enzyme uh, docking or attaching, they can uh, hydrolyze the GTP, the GDP. That is intrinsic to their function. And then associated with those uh, uh, transitions that we'll look at, are going to be configuration changes that are going to have a whole series of consequences, and that's what we'll look at. Um, they are, in many ways, the central signaling mechanism. They are. It's, it's hard to think of another uh, system which is more important for signaling. Uh, and uh, lots of diverse functions in addition to intercellular signaling, including everything from membrane vesicle transport, including synapse, uh, cytoskeletal assembly and regulation, cell growth, protein synthesis, uh, and um, uh, also involved in uh, transporting messages into the nucleus. Uh, and again, we will be working with two major groups. Most of the time, we're going to be talking about the heterotrimeric group, uh, the small group, very briefly today. So if we fo focus on these heterotrimeric G proteins, um, we see that they are involved in most, and I'm underlying most, transmembrane signaling in the nervous system. And, I, and again, I want to also return to the notion of the membrane, which was where we started. We started with the plasma membrane and how you make a membrane. And now you, each time we come back and we look at function, these things are not usually floating free in the cytoplasm. These things are happening on membranes. So this is a transmembrane signaling. It's going to take an extracellular signal and it's going to create in response to the extracellular signal, it's going to create an intracellular signal. This is, and it's the G protein that makes that extracellular to inter, intercellular uh, transition. For neurotransmitters, for most neurotransmitters, for hormones, for uh, chemokines and cytokines, all right? The only exceptions, and they're really not many, although this is quantitatively major, the only exceptions are the ligand gated ion channels, which are glutamate and GABA. Every other neurotransmitter is basically functioning through a G protein, all right? Um, the other thing is that there are a couple of uh, receptors that we'll, we will talk about very maybe April or May. We'll get to tyrosine kinases and guanylyl cyclase. <clears throat> Some of the effector proteins of these G proteins, which are converting the extracellular signal to the intracellular signal, is that they're using the intracellular signaling mechanisms. And those will include... Um, changing ion concentrations by regulating ion channels, um, as well as controlling cyclic AMP, 
both by regulating adenylate cyclase and phosphodiesterase. And then they also are going to trigger phospholipase C and phospholipase A2, which is going to have downstream, all of these cyclic AMP and phospholipase will then have major downstream consequences for uh, cyclic nucleotides. And some of the functions will be, like I said, as diverse as vesicular transport and the cytoskeleton. Now, this slide really is, in a way, the conventional view. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to have one slide on G proteins and some other talk, this is the slide that you'll see, all right? We want to go way beyond this, but it's valuable to look at this slide. Here are some of the families of G proteins. First of all, and these were discovered, by the way, in about 1980, there have been eight, just to emphasize the importance, since 1970, there have been eight Nobel Prizes in medicine awarded for work on G proteins, okay? That's, that's how the importance of this group of uh, proteins. So G subscript S, okay, stimulates, that's what it, the S stood for, it stimulates adenylate cyclase. This is where they were discovered. They were discovered when, when people were trying to figure out how you regulate adenylate cyclase, and they found these stimulatory proteins which were sensitive to GTP. And so they called them G proteins, yeah. We're on hold here. Okay, so sorry if you were not able to see before. Um, the, uh, continuing then, in addition, so we said these were found uh, as regulatory proteins for adenylate cyclase and then found to have far more effects. Some of the inhibitory, there's a whole family of inhibitory proteins, again, inhibiting adenylate cyclase. But then this group also was found to interact with potassium channels, voltage-gated calcium channel, which as you know is a, is a major part of uh, regulation of neuronal function. They activate phosphodiesterases, again, cyclic nucleotide. Uh, different family interacts with phospholipase C. Another family activates, you'll, we'll look at this later, this GEF, which is a guanine exchange factor. It'll make sense in about five slides. And this basically means that this is a G protein that regulates other G proteins. So this is going to, uh, one family of G proteins regulating another family of G proteins. This is a good slide. It's a good beginning because it shows you different uh, receptors. And we'll look at the relationship of receptors to G proteins in a minute. But it just shows you that each of these receptors, these red radiator looking receptors, are each of them attached to a G protein. And this has subunits that we'll look at in a second. And that they then regulate things like adenylate cyclase, which regulates um, a phosphokinase, uh, which is adenylate uh, sensitive, or uh, can uh, interact with the nucleus, or can create this rho GTPase, which can feed back on other G proteins, or, and this is extremely important, can activate phospholipase C. We're going to have a whole lecture on phospholipase C and its messengers, which are diacylglycerol and uh, inositol triphosphate. We're, that's a whole separate lecture. But, and we'll have, just as we'll have lectures on adenylate cyclase, and we'll have a lecture on calcium in the cell. But all of those are regulated by the G protein system, which is why we're doing this one first. This is just a joke. This is just how complex uh, you can uh, make diagrams involving G proteins because they have so many different functions in uh, signaling. 
Now, let's start to look at the structure of this character. So it's called heterotrimeric. That tri, you can, here's the, th the tri. So there are three uh, subunits, okay? They're all different from one another. It's heterotrimeric. So they're all different, all right? There's a single and they're simply named alpha, beta, and gamma, okay? Um, the different types of G proteins are distinguished, of course, by different subunits, but it's usually the alpha subunit which varies. The beta gamma pair is fairly conserved. It's going to get used for different things. It can be modified too, and we'll see how it can be modified, but, but it doesn't vary a whole lot, whereas the A's, the alphas, or that subunit really varies according to its function. Uh, all right, and the beta and gamma are the same. And I would say the beta and gamma hardly ever, if ever, dissociate from one another. So there, you're going to see them uh, dissociating as a dimer away from the alpha subunit. But you almost never see a beta, an isolated beta or gamma subunit. That doesn't occur. This is the structure of a G protein in general here up in the upper left. And what you can see is the, the, this orange beige is the alpha, okay? The blue is the beta, the green is the uh, gamma. The purple little guy here, that's the GTP or GDP. And the red is just this interface between alpha and beta, all right? And here's a, now in the upper right, uh, this shows it again, same sort of thing, uh, different. And you can see uh, the gamma section is fairly small. Um, that it's pretty integrally related with the uh, beta function. And here I've also put the structure of GTP for you, and all we need to do is cleave that to make GDP, is clue, take away one phosphate. Here, um, what I've done is, uh, so I like this diagram a lot, uh, and here we have the receptor, and I've introduced the term a GPCR, which is a G-protein coupled receptor. So the basic concept, take a step back here for a second, all right? You want to have a system which robustly allows you to signal, to control things like adenylate cyclase, the intracellular messenger systems, that and others. And you want to, so you've got multiple systems that you want to regulate inter, intracellularly. You have multiple ways of communicating right? Lots of different neurotransmitters, chemokines, and all sorts of things like that. Are you going to create a unique system for each external and each internal? You could have each, each external might interact with five different internal systems. If you have 10 different external systems, you now have 50 different systems that you're going to create. That doesn't work. So then you need an interface, you need a translator, you need something that can, with minimal modification, take an external signal and know which internal signal to interact with. And you also want to be able to modify that. You need to be able to turn it on. You need to be able to turn it off. You need to be able to make it turn off quickly or make it turn off slowly. Are you going to do that for each of the 50 different combinations? It's insane. You'd never get anywhere. So the G protein is an interface. The G protein family um, is an interface between the, the external signaling world and the internal signaling world. So you have these G protein coupled receptors. The receptor is not covalently bound to the alpha, to the, to the G protein. It's going to interact with it. It's going to induce a conformational change. It's even going to interact with it physically. But it's not. The receptor is not part of the G protein. The receptor is the receptor, and it is coupled to the G protein. And therefore, you use this term. This is our G protein coupled receptors. And that will be all the catecholamines receptors, okay? The opioid receptors. Okay, the endorphin, I mean, whatever you want, these are all G protein coupled receptors is what they are. That's how they're going to exert their influence on the cell. <clears throat> now, these proteins need to stay close to the receptor. And so you want them to stay put in the membrane. You don't want them floating off in the cytoplasm. That's not very useful. 
So how do we, if you just remember back to that initial lecture, there were lots of ways that we knew that we could embed a protein in the uh, bilayer. Now, this is not a very lipophilic protein. It does not embed itself. It, it's not a transmembrane. The G proteins are not transmembrane. They are entirely on the intracellular surface. Okay, how do you keep them there? No problem, stick a lipid on. Just put a big lipid chain on the nitrogen end of the peptide. Okay, and having done that, the, it now can't leave the membrane because it, every time it tries to pull the lipid out, the electrostatic interactions of van der Waals forces and the hydrophobicity of that big long chain just goes, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm staying up in here. And so without affecting the structure of the protein or configuration, you can embed it within the membrane. This was, I thought, a nice uh, cartoon. I don't know, I picked this one up about 9.30 this morning. So here you have a ligand binding uh, to the uh, receptor protein, all right? So notice that, notice that the, uh, the whole G protein is assembled, right? Here's the alpha, here's the beta, here's the gamma. We're gonna look at this in detail. But here is the whole thing, and a GDP is bound. This is the quiescent state. It's inactive, ain't doing nothing. The whole thing is assembled and GTP, GDP is bound. That's, it's just sitting there doing nothing at all. So we're gonna activate it. And we activate it not by interacting with it, but by interacting with the G protein coupled receptor. So this could be any old neurotransmitter that you want, this little red ball, but we could think of it as um, epinephrine. It doesn't really matter. And once that's bound, now that receptor protein attracts the G protein to it. And when it does, and it engages in this interaction, it also spits out the GDP. It induces a confirmation change in the G protein such that the GDP is, is excreted. It's, it's just thrown out of the cleft. Well, there's a whole lot more GTP floating around in the cell than there is GDP. And the configuration change makes, it, makes the GTP a better fit. So now the GTP comes in, okay, and is now two things happen. The alpha subunit has a GTP sitting in there, and the, the beta gamma dimer pair dissociates from the alpha pair. And now what you have are two active signaling systems, not one. This isn't like, okay, alpha's loose, it can do its thing, and beta and gamma would sort of hang out, waiting to go back. Oh no, beta and gamma are, are, if anything, maybe the more active signal transducer. We know very little about beta gamma right now. So we're, you're not gonna hear a lot, of, you're not gonna hear as much about it as you are about the alpha, because we understand the alpha better. But there's no question in anybody's mind that the beta gamma is at least as important as the alpha for signal. So you've created two systems. We're going to see uh, also when you hit phospholipase C, you're going to see the same thing happen. You're going to see diacyl, you're going to see a single molecule split in two, and both halves are active in different ways. But both halves are, are active signal. That's the case here. So uh, this is the basic story right here. This is it. We're going to, so uh, we're going to play this out several times, but this is, this is what's going on. All right, so this assess it in more detail. I'll go quick, the G protein at rest, the GDP, this is what you saw. I, I really don't need to go over it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what we talked about. Here's another cartoon. Uh, now that plays this around a little bit more in a bit more detail. Here's a receptor sitting uh, by itself. Here's a G protein sitting by itself. We then bind the neurotransmitter to the G protein coupled receptor. The G protein coupled receptor then interacts with the G protein. Okay, when it does that, GDP is emitted. GTP takes its place. The beta gamma pair dissociates from the alpha pair. And notice the two arrows here. The receptor drifts off. It still has a, it still has a neurotransmitter bound. It doesn't hold on to the alpha uh, uh, firmly. As soon as the beta gamma pair floats away, the alpha does, isn't interacting with the receptor anymore. In most cases, sometimes it actually can, but that's, a, that's an exception. And then both the alpha and the beta gamma dimer then become active 
to activate all of the signaling cascades that will be, this is gonna be our next four lectures, is this box. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm just go finish that. And then, and now this is, how do you end this signal, right? If, right, we always go like a Morse, key, Morse uh, code key, right? If I just only press it and never let it up, I can't transmit a lot of information, do I? I have to push and up, push and up. Okay, so a signal has to be on and off, or it only gets to be used once. <laughs> okay, and we don't want that. So then we have to restore the system to its initial quiescent state. And that's where the GTP hydrolysis comes in. So the, the alpha subunit, okay, has its own intrinsic GTP hydrolysis activity. So at, with a time constant, that's going to depend on a lot of things. There's going to be a native rate that it has, and then we're going to be able to either speed it up or slow it down. So we, that's how we're going to regulate this system, is by, by either speeding up the GTP hydrolysis or slowing down the GTP hydrolysis. That's the regulatory step but it has its own intrinsic activity. So after some period of time, the GTP is converted to GDP, all right? It stays bound to the alpha. In that configuration, the beta gamma reanneal with the alpha, but it doesn't reanneal with the receptor, right? The receptor throws out its neurotransmitter and the system starts over again, ready to go, all right? If you think about this for a second, and this anticipates some of the later slides, okay, um, you might say, well, then uh, one way of, of making the system much more active would be to prevent this hydrolysis from occurring and keep that signal persistent. That works to a certain extent, but I'll say again, if you're gonna transmit a signal, it has to go on and off and on and off. You have to be able to reuse it. So it may cause that individual neurotransmitter, that one interaction, to, um, to have a prolonged effect. But that prolonged effect may not be constant. And it may be, for instance, if it's letting in calcium. At a certain point, the cell becomes saturated. And maintaining the signal on doesn't really do you any good. What you really need to do is end the signal. So causing the signal to persist doesn't necessarily mean a stronger stimulus to the neuron. It actually may be a shorter stimulus and a, a, less, a less strong stimulus. It may be better to signal quickly than to signal long and infrequently. Okay? G protein function. So we again, I think we've been through this. This is the, this slide. Uh, Roman numeral two just shows the re, the system returning back, relaxing, and we've been through it. Okay, here's another picture. You know, I like cartoons, and um, so uh, this is a, a first of all, it's a specific example. Secondly, it's a more detailed uh, picture, uh, and so let's just take a moment and look at it. Uh, here is the uh, here's the adrenergic receptor. This is its uh, uh, epinephrine binding site. Here's the epinephrine that is unbound. So the receptor is not associated with the G protein. Uh, we go ahead and bind the adrenaline into its receptor. And the net result then is that the, um, uh, the uh, GDP is thrown out that now has GTP in it. In this configuration, the beta and gamma are off doing their own thing. The alpha with the GTP bound is able to interact with the adenylate cyclase, which is a enzyme membrane, uh, membrane protein here to generate cyclic AMP. Okay, that's how the system works. And now it's a cyclic AMP, which has the cellular effects. There's a lot of words on this slide, but I'm gonna take my time with it um, because I think that it conveys a lot of information that's important, and so I'm leaving it here. Uh, G proteins weakly hydrolyze. G, here, this is we're talking about the regulation now, just like it says. So the G proteins can weakly hydrolyze the GTP, and they break down the bond to make GDP, and in that state they come together. This hydrolysis reaction, however, occurs very slowly, meaning that the G proteins have a built-in timer. Okay, they're gonna if if you don't if you don't turn the switch off on your own, 
the switch is going off anyway, right? It's just like a bathroom heater or something like that. You don't want to you don't want to walk out of the bathroom and leave the heater running uh, forever all day long while you're at work, okay? It uses a lot of electricity and it can create a fire. So you want the thing shutting off. So you put a time switch on it. So you can turn it off faster if you want. If when you're done and you want to leave, you just turn it off. But if you forget, it's still going to turn off in 30 minutes. That's how this system works. That's exactly what this system is. All right. Now you, we got to be able to interact with it though and change that 30 minutes. What if we want? What if we want it to wait 60 minutes? Or what if we want it off immediately? So then you create these GTP ACE, GTP ACE activating proteins. The GTP ACE activity. That's the hydrolysis. So these are GTP ACE activating proteins, meaning that they accelerate the hydrolysis. They turn the switch off. So instead of a 30 minute timer, they make it a two minute timer. Now, those are called gap proteins. I'm introducing terms. Remember we said there's a lot of language. Then you saw the term before of the GEF, that is the guanine nucleotide exchange factor. What these proteins do is they kick out the GDP faster. So the GDP is sitting there in the quiet enzyme. You want to be able to activate this enzyme, the, the G protein. You want to activate it. You've got to get rid of the GDP in order for the GTP to come in. So the, one of the ways of regulating the protein is to go to the G protein and just extract the GDP and say, get out and get, you know, wake up and go to work. Okay. So that's those are GEFs. Tell them to wake up and go to work. They accelerate this whole process. They can make this happen much faster. But you can also inhibit it, okay, by, uh, and so the GEFs accelerate the process, the GDIs slow down the process here. GAPs, GEFs, and GDIs, okay? I love this cartoon. This was, I don't know, about 6.30 this morning I found this one. I've, I've been on this lecture since last night. So here's a good example. Here's cholera toxin. So we're looking at the G protein interaction with adenylate cyclase. Uh, the beta gamma has already disappeared. The GTP is bound. So this thing has already been activated, right? Um, and it's interacting with the adenylate cyclase, which activates made cyclic AMP, which makes protein kinase A and phosphorylates a chloride channel, and out it goes. And, and now here, the cholera toxin inactivates GTPase. The cholera, that, that's it. Cholera toxin inactivates the GTPase activity of the G protein. That leaves the, the alpha subunit turned on, period. This is turned on and it can't, it, it, you can't get, it can't get rid of the GTP, okay? And that's it, the system is on. So it keeps running, it keeps generating a cyclic A, it keeps turning the protein kinase, and in the brush border, it keeps phosphorylating the chloride channel, and you end up with watery diarrhea because you just keep excreting chloride and water because the G protein can't shut off. That's toxin. I mean, what a simple and clear way of understanding the system. Okay, Here, here's another one. This is much more complicated, and I like this one for a couple of reasons. So now here's oxytocin. Here's a very specific example, oxytocin interacting with the oxytocin receptor. Um, here's the whole G protein that now interacts. The GDP goes off, the GTP goes on, the beta gamma subunit goes away, the GTP alpha subunit is bound to phospholipase C. Um, not covalently bound, but just electrostatically in around. It, goes and does, and phospholipase C does its thing, generating diacylglycerol, okay, and um, the inositol triphosphate, both of which go about their business. DAG activates a protein kinase C, which is a huge signaling system, and the uh, IP3 goes down and interacts with ligand-gated calcium channels, which is another huge system, okay? All of it regulated by the G protein. That here's an example now where uh, upon binding of the ligand, I, this I like because this interact, this picture just shows you that the beta gamma system, while this is going and doing interacting with metabolic enzymes, the beta gamma system is interacting with an ion channel. And that's very common. 
a lot of the potassium channels, the voltage-gated calcium channel, these are not trivial signaling systems, right? I mean, this is this is the potassium channel sets off the the uh, action potential. These are, these are not trivial systems. The voltage-gated calcium channel is what makes it all work. Okay, so th that's what I'm saying. These are, these are not minor systems that we're talking about here. They are regulated by the beta gamma subunit, not the alpha subunit. So don't be, you know, minimizing the role here. Um, pheromones, bless their hearts, are uh, also regulated by beta and gamma. Okay, um, that's what we're saying here. And this is, I've just said it. So the beta gamma subunit is just as important or maybe more important for all we know, because all of these channels here are seem to be regulated by the beta gamma. Okay, I'm mindful of the time. I don't know how I feel about this pro this picture. I, I sort of liked it for a while because it's acetylcholine and so it's different, but, it's, but here it shows the alpha subunit interacting with the channel and that's probably not correct. It's probably the beta gamma subunit which interacts and I'll probably replace this slide. I, I liked it, so I left it. Notice, one of the reasons that I like this is if, look at the bilayer just sitting there. I keep saying this is all happening on the membrane. This is all membrane activity. I think we beat this horse here. Uh, so here's just an example of the G protein, very specifically interacting with cyclic AMP system. It regulates both the adenylate cyclase, and it also, by the way, regulates, so the G alpha S subunit turns on adenylate cyclase, and the G I subunit turns on phosphodiesterase, or another set of specific um, uh, acetyl um, adenylate cyclases. And this is, we've seen this picture. Um, then we're, when we talk about uh, transduction of photoreception, now the ligand, okay, of the G protein, let's, let's be clear, we've been talking about G protein coupled receptors. And the, and the basic concept, what we, the assumption has been that there's an interaction with a signaling molecule, a oxytocin we saw, or acetylcholine, or blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? Sometimes it's not a neurotransmitter or, or peptide. Sometimes it could be light, it could be a photon, which triggers the receptor, or it could be a molecule which we taste or smell, okay? So it may be the, the olfactory receptor, or like I said, the taste receptor, which then alters the balance of how the G protein is sitting in association with a set of receptors, okay? And now you can do taste, and there is no neurotransmitter, um, but, but it's the molecule itself, or again, the photon of light. Or it could be the sound wave being transmitted through the tympanic membrane. So it can be physical as well. G proteins can stimulate the phosphonocytide. We're gonna have a whole um, lecture on this. Um, here's an example of uh, the um, uh, interacting with phospholipase C. And this is a good cartoon. Uh, here is some hypothetical receptor, okay, which is, notice this receptor is phosphorylated. Uh, uh, and then uh, here's the phospholipase C, which then interacts with the receptor with its neurotransmitter bound. Um, and, but in this case, it is the beta gamma subunit, which ultimately interacts with the um, phospholipase enzyme. Um, we can now, uh, there are also G protein receptor kinases. So now we're starting to look at, at more complexity and regulation because we, you have these, right, GPCRs. You have these G protein coupled receptors. And we've been looking at how you can regulate the G protein, but you could also modify the receptor so that it is either more avidly bound to the G protein or less avidly bound to the G protein. So that's a whole nother way of, and those are G protein receptor kinases. Kinase puts a phosphate group on it, okay? So another, another whole level, another whole level, and those are GRK, GRKs. You're gonna see these things. I mean, part, this is a language and, and this is what I was saying yesterday, I guess, that this is a whole language that you're learning and you're gonna see these GRKs and you're gonna find that they're really important in disease states and pharmacologic cases. Um, 
you can't touch psychiatry anymore without, without getting into this system. Okay, we'll come back to that at the end. But, but this is just the, the example. See, here's a GRK. Notice, look at this feedback loop, okay? So here's the receptor, here's the GRK, here's the G protein, right? Um, the, the, it's activated the receptor. Uh, the receptor uh, does its thing, the G protein dissociates, alpha does its thing, beta, gamma come together. What do they do? They interact with a G protein receptor kinase that goes ahead and phosphorylates the receptor and might make it less active. This way you have, you can create a feed forward excitation or a feed forward inhibition if you want, okay? All right, so if you use this system too much, it could feed back and say, whoa, you know, like this is you're gonna burn yourself out, don't do this. Or it may say, I like this. Let me, let me tell you a story, how I got interested in this system. I was junior faculty and I was reading about cyclic AMP. And if you wonder why I always go back to phylogeny evolution, this was one of the this this was one of the things. I was I'm just beginning to learn about cyclic AMP. I'm looking up cyclic AM uh, cyclic AMP, and I find that the slime mold, which can either exist in a unicellular state or as a hyphae, as a as a as a as a large structure. The, the mold, the slime mold, okay, that the signal is release of cyclic AMP from the individual cells. And when the concentration of cyclic AMP hits a certain level in the extracellular soup, it's not in an organism, but in the vicinity, then they, then they adhere to one another. So it's a feed forward system. If there's just a couple cells floating around, then all they do is keep replicating and doing their thing. But when they get to a certain level, which they that certain level, that number of cells of mass of, is determined by the concentration of cyclic AMP in the environment. And when the concentration of cyclic AMP hits a certain level, then the thing anneals into a slime mold. This is the beginning of life. These guys are at the begin at the origin of life. Okay. And their cyclic AMP is their cycle as their signaling mechanism. So what have we done? We learned to regulate the cyclic AMP, each layer of, of, of organism, each growth of family, as you move to plant and you move to animal and you move to, you know, multicellular organisms are learning to uh, co-opt these systems, okay, and use them for other purposes. And the brain is the ultimate, the human brain is the ultimate. And if, you know, each other organism, each other organ may use it for five or 10 different things. And the brain is using it for 500 different things. Okay, that's, but it uses the basic fundamental system. It, it doesn't, it just keeps regulating, it, making it more specific, making it more modulable. Okay, and the G protein is the ultimate and the movement of extracellular signal to intracellular signal. And that's the basic message here. And this is just a great slide. I love this slide. This is, they said, well, it could be an opiate or a D2 receptor. It makes no difference. And here it is, and it's phosphorylated by a G protein. And, and, and this is some of the feedback from the, you know, pars reticulata and the pars compacta. And, and now you're, you know, other systems from the brainstem coming up and regulating the substantia nigra and the D2 receptor is getting regulated. And you're gonna be talking about this stuff, you know, in, in January and February. But, but you have to understand how these systems work now. And, and this is how they work. So now, so, the, so you're gonna be talking about this character and it's phosphorylation of the receptor, making it more or less sensitive. And then when the receptor is activated, that look at beta gamma does runs off and hits MAP kinases and modifies ion channels, and the alpha subunit keeps interacting. This is a pretty constant thing, is that it keeps interacting with the cyclic nucleotide, all right? But then you get these other proteins, which are RGS proteins, which we're gonna talk about, okay? So that's what we're saying is that my, you had that prior slide, which had lots of words that the, that the GTPA uh, activating proteins, okay, are important. But now I want to introduce another class. And these are the, look at the name, regulator of G protein signaling. 
regulator of G protein signaling. The abbreviation is RGS. That's another abbreviation you're going to see. You're going to see class RGS4. You want to understand schizophrenia? Then you're going to have to read about RGS4. Okay? That's the way it goes. This, this is the systems that we deal with. All right? And, by the way, when you look at the um, substantia nigra, and you realize that part of it is the nigrostriatal pathway and part of it is the mesolimbic pathway. And when you interact with the dopamine receptor, you, you interact with both. And so when you're trying to treat Parkinson's, you make them crazy. When you're trying to treat the schizophrenia, you make them Parkinsonian. But the RGSs are not necessarily the same in those two populations. So when our pharmacology gets to that level, and that's where we're going, where we can interact with RGS-6, I made that up, but not RGS-4, then you're going to be able to treat the Parkinsonism without making the person crazy. Then maybe Lewy body disease will have a way of being treated because we won't have to make them nuts with it, which is what happens when you try to treat them with cinnamon and just put more dopamine in. We won't do it that way. The more selective our knowledge becomes, the more selective our pharmacology becomes. Okay, that's where the whole system's going. That's why I'm saying for you to practice neurology for the next 30 or 40 years, you need to know this language. Okay, so these regulator of G proteins, RGSs, are a family of a G of gaps. That means that they are capable of altering the GTPase activity rate down to the A subunit. Okay, if they can either make it go faster or make it go slower, and they're all part of this um, raft that is present. And you remember the term raft, the group of proteins together. And this slide, we don't need to go over it. But when you go over it, you can see that you can either accelerate or slow down the either the kicking out of the GDP or the hydrolysis of the GDP. So if you get from here to here, you have to throw out the GDP, find GTP. You can make it go faster, you can make it go slower. From here to end the signal, you have to be able to hydrolyze the GTP and return it to GTP. You can make it go faster, you can make it go slow. All right, everything is regulable. All right, um, and, and sometimes you do it by modifying them. The beta gamma unit in particular is frequently given a lipid chain that, that causes it to even more firmly interact with the um, plasma membrane. And we are talking about the plasma membrane. Because this is about you know, external to internal signaling. So this is at the plasma membrane, which we're going to talk about now in a minute. And this is just that slide again, same slide that you saw before. And here we're showing, uh, the, again, the point is the liquidation. And there are lots of different ones. And I'll say again, uh, if a bond can be made, then a bond can be broken. All right? That means that you could regulate this too if you want. And it probably is regulated by somebody else. Okay? Yeah, I think we just have a couple more. We'll, we'll be done before one o'clock. Now, um, we, we already looked at these. The GD, G proteins are ADP ribosylated by bacterial uh, toxins. So um, the alpha subunit in particular uh, can be ribosylated by the cholera toxin. We saw that. Okay? And that, that ribosylation is what destroys the GTPase activity. Pertussis tox uh, toxin also interacts with uh, the uh, different family of G proteins than the cholera toxin. And there's another uh, protein uh, that's diphtheria. All these toxins are interacting through the G protein. And I don't really like this slide. I just put it in here. So if you want to look at ADP ribosylation, you can. Um, and I sort of like this because I, what I mostly liked about it is that it shows you this whole complex as a complex, including its lipids, which now make its way to the intracellular, which is what I want to talk about next. All right. Everything what we've been saying is about the large heterotrimeric G protein. And I've only got a couple minutes left. And that's because we don't understand the small G proteins as well. The small G proteins, and this is what they're called, they're called small G proteins, okay? They also have this GD, GTP, GDP, and hydrolysis. So they are, that's why they're G proteins. They do that. They bind GTP, they hydrolyze it to GDP. But their function is at the intracellular side of the world. 
and they interact with intracellular membranes. So the proteins, which are extremely important, look at this, a RAS protein. You want to talk about cancer? Okay. Then you're going to talk about RAS. All right. That's a, what is a RAS protein? Well, it's a small, it's one of the small G proteins. So then we better understand these. Okay. And by the way, these only occur in animal cells. You don't even find them in plants. Okay. Most of the functions of the small G proteins, this is a, this is, this is where I need to spend more time. I'm telling you that if I had more time, if I weren't given a lecture today, I'd, this is where I'd be focusing. Is they have these RAB proteins that are localized to synaptic vesicles. I'll show you pictures of that. The Rho proteins, okay, are, which are the GEF proteins, interact with micro, actin microfilaments. What's the cytoskeleton of the plasma membrane? Microfilaments, right? Out then, okay. They also are involved in gene regulation. So all these R proteins, small GTP, uh, small G, uh, G proteins. Um, the RAB protein is very much involved uh, in the uh, membrane vesicle trafficking. Uh, after, the after the vesicle, uh, it, uh, you may remember that the vesicle had to go through a docking mechanism. It had to come out of a reserve pool. It had to be prepared. That function, okay, is regulated by G protein. After it bound to the synaptic membrane, we saw the um, we we saw one of the mechanisms was a clathrin coating to take it back out and recycle. That's regulated by a small G protein. Okay, so these uh, RABs uh, interact uh, heavily in exocytosis. This is a good slide. I just picked this picture up at I don't know about eleven o'clock today. Um, and here, this is an excellent slide, and it shows you the RAB, which itself is being interacted with through the GAP proteins, GDI proteins, GDF proteins, into an active form associated with the vesicle, which now makes it capable of membrane fusion. All right? I'm not going to get into any detail. Here's trafficking of membrane through the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We talked about this just yesterday and the Golgi apparatus. And, and this is a regulatory mechanism through the, by regulating the G protein, you regulate the movement from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. I mean, what could be more basic or fundamental than this? And these are regulated by, these are small G proteins. They're not plasma membrane. Remember, the, the, the heterotrimeric lives at the plasma membrane. Okay, these are not plasma membrane. This is internal membrane. So you're dealing with small G proteins. Neurofibromatosis is a mutation in a gap protein that regulates RAS. I mean, you're not, you know, you can't escape this. This is this is up to 30% of all cancers involve RAS oncogenes. But what they are is they they screw up the regulation of the G protein. They turn the G protein on and leave it on. But this, that particular G protein, which is regulated by that particular RAS that leads to cancer, just keeps, once it's turned on, it just keeps dividing. The cell keeps dividing, which is what the cancer is. So it's dividing because the GTP hydrolysis has been prevented, okay? The regulation of the basic G protein has failed. And so you end up with a, a, um, a uh, perpetually dividing cell, which is cancer, okay? And I'll say again that, that you're, you're not going to get, if you look up mechanisms of schizophrenia now, you're not getting anywhere without, without getting into RGS proteins. The RGS protein, uh, uh, the uh, receptor um, G protein signaling, okay? And the psychotropic drugs, the opiate receptors, well, look at this. An opiate receptor is 10 times more sensitive if you ablate this regulatory protein. So these, that tells you the, the huge influence that these regulatory proteins have on pain, okay? And this is a really good slide that shows you uh, the sort of thing that we're talking about here uh, for these uh, regulatory G proteins, okay? All right. That's it. Now, the next four lectures are the pathways, are the downstream pathways that are regulated by the G proteins. That's where we're going. And then we're done. Then the neurochemistry is over.
we'll all take a break for the holidays. 